Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo, discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks. I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. Brian, coming from the cave. I got the dogs barking. I'm on a new mic today, so I might sound a little wonky. Hopefully not. Try and fix that. It's just one of those mornings, Brian, where you just want to stick your head in the sand. But anyway, we're here. Let's do it. Might sound better if we stuck our head in the sand. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Less echo for damn sure. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so, Brian, I bought some ETH this week. I jumped into the crypto. All right. Uh, any well, planning on buying some NFTs? As no, what's, Brian. What, what brought this about? Uh, I plan on minting some NFTs. Oh, Christ. Here's the deal. We've been talking on this show it, it, for months and months now about NFTs and how silly they are. And we tell everybody, hey, if you can make some money off of it, take the bags of money and run. And I'm like, you know, we give a lot of good advice on this show. Sometimes we should maybe follow it. So, all right, gonna um, put up some of your photography. Uh, maybe, maybe while you're at it, throw up a grumpy old geeks uh, NFT and see if anybody bites. Well, we're definitely gonna throw up a grumpy old geeks NFT. That's for damn sure. But uh, no, I'm gonna try and I got to figure this out. This is this is it's a learning experience for me, Brian, because I have a physical mm-hmm. object that I want to tie to an NFT that I want to actually sell, mm-hmm. which is in its own meta way, kind of a disappearing asset because I have. The what they call the blue lines from the book Idoru from William Gibson. Mm-hmm. Now, those are the it's the proof that they send to William when they're like marking it up to finish to go to press. Yes. So I bought mm-hmm. this a long time ago. I've talked about it on the show a couple of times, but it's signed by William. I have a certificate of authenticity for it, mm-hmm. but you can't expose it to light for very long because it will fade to blank paper. And then all you will have are just the notes on blank sheets of paper. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I want to try and figure out how to make an NFT out of that and sell the book and the NFT at the same time. So that's, gotcha. that's what I need to do because this book has been sitting on a shelf for 15 years. <laughs> and I bought it as a as a Christmas gift for a girlfriend who ended up being kind of a you know dumpster fire. Yes. So yeah. I kept mm-hmm. it. <laughs> so. I, I, rem- I, I am well aware of your dating history. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 We had pizza with her. It, uh, <laughs> it, it after we saw the Goo Goo Dolls at New Year's. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Anyway, so the the funny part about the the ETH transaction that I got because I got my MetaMask uh, wallet set up. And I went and I went and bought the ETH. I, I went and bought $250 worth just to cover the bases because I don't know how much the minting is going to cost and all that. And I'd rather just have enough and mm-hmm. instead of not enough. Not have to deal with it twice. Exactly. Because yeah. you get to pay transaction fees and all that crap. So I got it. It cost me like $263 after, trans- okay. after the Ticketmaster cost, you know? Yes, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, as soon as it, it lands in my wallet, it's already down to two thirty five. What the fuck is wrong with this shit? <laughs> I know, I, crypto's crazy. Now, let me just—I'll I'll get into this a bit again then too, because we do talk about this all the time on the show, and, and we not only make fun of NFTs, but we also make fun of crypto just in general. I think we've had you know one solid bit of crypto advice all along, which is don't use money that you wouldn't just take to Vegas and blow. Right. It, That's it, rule yeah. number one. Free money. Yeah. Only use free money. So I have crypto. I, I I have three. I have Ethereum. I have Bitcoin. And I have Filecoin. Not a lot. Just a little bit. And here's my other bit of crypto advice. And this has held pretty solid for me for the last few months. And I've made a bit of money off of it. Buy Bitcoin when it's low, around 30000 mm-hmm. And then sell when it gets high, which is basically any time over 4500 or 45000 Okay. Because it seems to be slowly vacillating between lows under just under 30 k and highs peaking at around 50 k And it just keeps bouncing back and forth like a tennis match between those two. Yep. And I just keep doing that. And it's working. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. I was talking to Kevin Rose about this. And the one thing he does, he had a really good point. And he's like, if you look at the history of with uh, the history of Bitcoin, there are massive spikes. And then it comes down and it normalizes, but the floor Mm -hmm. is always rising. You know, the floor now is at like around 30,000, like you're saying. Um, But then then it'll peak back up. I don't know what it's at right now. It was like 48 or something. Something like Something that. Like it's, that. It's, it's uh, I'm at the point where I where I should probably sell. Okay, and then it'll <laughs> yeah, then it'll drop back down, and then yep. you know let the cycle lather, rinse, repeat. Um, exactly. 
but he he was he, he did make a very good point is that 30,000 will be 31,000, 32,000, 33,000. That's that's what everybody who is into crypto is like, you know, banking on that, that floor is just going yeah, to keep the floor rising. just keeps getting higher and higher. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So as soon as I get uh figure out the open sea stuff, um well, we're <laughs> going to put up the first grumpy old geeks as an NFT. Fuck it, True. why not? Why not? You can have it because because the rest of them aren't making us any money. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, if you're using Coinbase for your uh, for your Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, uh, you might have gotten an email that freaked you out this weekend. The major cryptocurrency exchange said it mistakenly told about 125,000 customers that their two factor authentic- authentication systems or settings had been changed. Ooh. This email and SMS notification were sent due to, and I love the air quotes here. Internal error and not, <laughs> intern, not the result of a hack, error. <laughs> probably. Like, yeah. So uh, it, it all happened over the course of about 82 minutes on Friday. It was followed up with a second email stating that the message was sent by mistake. But at least one person in that period of time sold around 60000 worth of their crypto because they were worried they'd lose it somehow. Uh, uh, there was understandable concern in the wake of the report from last week in which Coinbase customers claimed their accounts were hacked and they couldn't contact employees for help. Because nobody can contact anybody for help because there are no customer service departments for any any web company anymore. Anymore, so. yeah. We were so silly back in the day by doing that. <laughs> the company has now said it's ruling out <laughs> ruling out voice and live chat support options. Uh, doubtful. So. It's, it's so funny that the best customer support in the industry comes from porn sites and uh, ransomware assholes mm-hmm. <laughs> those mm-hmm. are the two best because <laughs> porn sites don't want chargebacks so they'll do nope. anything to get you there including some of the most nefarious shit that i've ever heard of um it, we, i'm not going to go into that one but uh and of course ransomware because they just want your money but uh yep. yeah regular what are supposed to be legitimate above the board businesses do not have any kind of customer support whatsoever yeah, as we've been saying for years now, it's basically just shaming them on Twitter to hope somebody gets back to you. That's it. That's it. So did yeah. you get the the notification? I did not. I didn't either. So Yeah. Yeah, 125,000 users. They got millions of users, so I'm guess yeah, it was just a exactly. yeah, tempest in a teapot on that one. I love this one. This is just for the the headline alone. Tesla on autopilot crashes into two parked cars. Again. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to keep your non-Tesla car safe, paint it red. Oh my God! So this uh, this happened down in Orlando, and here's here's the real kicker: it hit a cop car. <laughs> nice. <Oops. laughs> yeah. So a cop was investigating a, a a stalled car on the side of the road, and then Tesla just comes right along and bangs into both of them. So mm-hmm. they, which could have been you know a horrible tragedy, um, but when is it when when is this going to come to pass that people just stop using autopilot because it's dangerous it is not autopilot it is barely pilot you know what's i i just don't well, understand. the transportation safety board is is working through the process of trying to get tesla to at least rename it <laughs> yeah, well, okay renaming it great Cru- cruise yeah. control two or no 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 what do you know uh, cruise uh, control plus. plus that's it that's it we live in the <laughs> land of plus so yes. <laughs> cruise control plus oh god so yeah still happening and I saw mm-hmm. this uh, friend of the show, Kent Nichols, or I don't know if he's a friend of the show. I don't even know if he listens to the show, but he's a friend of mine from Ask a Ninja. He, he wrote a tweet, said, want to feel old? Freshmen in high school were born in 2007, the year the first iPhone was released, which I immediately yeah, replied to go die in a fucking fire for reminding <laughs> me of that. And it was just funny because that weekend, like the weekend before he posted this, I had found my first iPhone, which I still have. Mm-hmm which is the slippery bar of soap, which has it. I mean, it has battle scars on it, man. It is dented and scraped and scratched because when you were at the bar, you had a cold pint in one hand, then you'd reach yep. down and pick up your phone. That thing would fucking fly out of your hand, like a bar of dial in the, in, in the shower in the morning. It was go boom. <laughs> uh, All but, right. Yeah. F- 14 years ago, 14. Yep. We, we be old Jason. <sighs> And uh, two other little bits of follow-up. Now, C-Rod is just one of many, many people that wrote me directly about the show last week and about their debate over uh, (laughs) skateboards and whether they have changed any since you were a child and you were riding your skateboard around. Uh, They have. They're not made of space-age materials in quotes here. And then he links to the best carbon fiber skateboards in 2021. So I yes, have I, well. Here's the thing about this: different Brian. skateboards now than no, we there had were this back when you were a kid. Yeah, these are novelty boards. We had this back then too. We had Bonite. We had um, 
ever slick. We had all of this crap back then. The thing is, they're novelty boards. They try this every now and again. Uh, Flight Deck is the new Powell one. Uh, Steve Caballero wrote it for a while, and then he stopped writing it. You know why? Because it sucked. It was too squishy. So we've this has been a cycle since the 80s. You know, it's nothing new. But when it comes down to it, seven-ply maple, straight-up fucking indies and urethane wheels with regular bearings are still the de facto fucking skateboard that everybody rides. So, you know... Go out and just see a skater on the street. Well, you're in Toronto now. You could go find a snowboarder or a snowmobiler. <laughs> Maybe they have one lying around. But the shit's still the same. It's still the same. Same Zambonis as they always rode. Exactly. Now, Sid also wrote in, well worth the time to watch the whole video about McDonald's and Taylor ice cream machines. This guy seems to have done a lot of investigation into the matter. P.S. Love your show. And this is where I have to briefly complain again to you, Jason, about the new method that you're using for our show notes. I cannot easily tell where the hell I'm assuming this is a YouTube link, but the way you've changed it, I actually have to click on it. Yes, it is a YouTube link. Okay. Well, there you go. The real reason <laughs> McDonald's ice cream machines are always broken. The problem is that I have to like copy and paste these into the actual show notes, so I can't do it. I I, I have to do it this way. But if you uh, cursor over it, it will say YouTube.com. That there's a hover state. Sorry about that. Oh, and then now the dogs are going hmm. bug nutty. I'm not. Great. I'm not getting the hover state. Interesting. Oh, Let's interesting. Check my settings on that. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, that's it for follow up. Okay. The show notes are broken as well as the ice cream machines. <laughs> And the show. And the show. <laughs> In the news. No, I saw this one over at the Next Web, and it uh, it piqued my interest. An end to constant cookie warnings. UK plans post Brexit overhaul of data laws. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, we have the fucking lovely EU to thank for those stupid ass cookie pop ups. I'm just so used to it now. I, I'm just so, so annoying. used to it. It's I, so annoying. It's not going to change just because the UK is going to change it. GDPR is still going to require it, so we're screwed. Ah, uh, they're talking about changing it and making it only for quote unquote like high risk sites. What the hell does that mean? Judging from normal uh, browsing these days, that's all sites. All sites, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, what what qualifies as a high risk site? And if it's a high risk site, do you really think they care about your fucking cookie notice? No, no. Uh, I'm sorry, every fucking website on the planet uses cookies it's the way it works look we should treat this the way that we treat so many other things which it, when it was brand new okay require the notification so people are aware of it we've all clicked on it 10 gazillion times now let's move on and still require the same sort of thing let's have it be a little bottom a little link down at the bottom with the privacy policy and the tos can we stop it with the fucking pop-ups i know this it's it's ridiculous because it breaks so many websites because there are no decent web programmers out there anymore i swear the the industry of web programming has gone down the shitter <laughs> oh god it's so bad so yeah i will see how this comes out but i don't think it's gonna i i don't i don't buy it i don't buy it one yeah. bit yep and uh apple has agreed to change several rules that govern its app store as part of its settlement with developers who filed a class action lawsuit against the company now i'm not sure if agreed is the correct verb when you've lost a lawsuit <laughs> <I know. laughs> and you are required to do so but <laughs> let me explain when you when you are convicted of a crime you do not agree to go to jail <laughs> <laughs> not how it works <laughs> so i thought that was the funniest part of the entire article but uh so they're basically yes they're they're clarifying that developers <laughs> are permitted to email users about payment methods outside of their ios app they simply cannot put that in the app themselves uh, the company has also agreed to publish transparency reports detailing app store rejection rates and the app review process so more transparency, which is good. And other changes are being made meant to give developers more flexibility in setting their prices. They will have a number of price points available to app makers from fewer than 100 to more than 500. Okay. Okay. And finally, uh, they were saying in response to COVID-19 that reduced commissions to 15% for developers making less than $1 million a year. They are going to keep that in effect for at least three years now. Okay. So, I'm glad they agreed to the rules of the lawsuit. Oh, thank you so much, Tim Cook, for agreeing <laughs> to this. You are so magnanimous. <laughs> and uh, Instagram is going to require users to share their birthday. An update the company says is meant to protect the youth, again, using its app. So they, they are basically, they've already asked for this for a long time. But if you signed up before the end of 2019, you may not have shared your birth date. I know I haven't. Over the next few weeks, Instagram will begin 
cookie style prop ups prompting users who haven't previously shared a birthday to do so. They will be able to dismiss them for a while, but eventually will require birthdays from everyone. They say they will use this information with artificial intelligence to detect when a user may have provided a false birthday and that some users may then be asked to verify their age with no procedure in place as of yet for actual verification of anything. As we know, Instagram, not so great at verifying. Uh, Owned by Facebook. What do you expect? Yes. Yes. What do you expect? I love the fact. It's like, um, (laughs) it's so stupid. It's going to use AI to detect that you may have provided a false birthday. Is it start going to do age recognition on your photos? Because if you say you're born in 1902, that... Probably, um, if I were to guess how they're going to use it it's going to be uh, based on who they're who you're following who's following you and what sort of things that you're searching for who's zooming who okay exactly and china is further slashing kids gaming time to just three hours a week oh now, this is going to end poorly. often not known for good ideas <laughs> i i do like this one this is going so to end cr- so poorly brian so poorly how, you think so hmm. three Why hours a week for one of the biggest gaming countries in the world no, actually, it apparently isn't really. Not a lot of people play games there in comparison to, say, here in terms of time spent. So, But it is interesting they're trying to cap it even further, and it's going to have definite impacts on Tencent because uh, you know their online gaming thing is a huge part of their company. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, God, I, I, I kind of wish the, the Canada would put a crackdown on the amount of hours my kid could use my iPad. Well, you can put a crackdown on the amount of hours that your kid can use your yeah, iPad. You can, you can be try. China, Brian. You can be <laughs> China. Hmm. I'll leave that to my wife, who's actually Chinese. <laughs> she can do the crackdown. And I saw this, and I just scratched my head a little bit. Clubhouse adds spatial audio to create more immersive audio chats. So wouldn't it make more sense if they sounded like rooms? No. No. Well, yeah, they think that they, they seem to think so. So, you know, you might be wearing if you wear the right equipment, because they already say it's not going to work over Bluetooth, you'll be able to hear where their voice is coming from, not just what they sound like. Now, if it's all virtual. Exactly. Where the fuck is somebody's voice actually coming from? From the mouth of God. Like, do you then get a setting in Clubhouse to say, I'd like to be stage right oh it's in the Maybe metaverse three feet in background oh metaverse it's in it's the metaverse only metaverse yeah, i gotcha it's in the metaverse okay. this is this is you know grasping that that one last grasp it's like okay we got a <laughs> bunch of money we got to throw some features in because our core feature is not really a category design feature it is a webinar it's, it's, yes. with no video webinar. Um, yes. and, uh, you can't listen to it later. So it's scheduled programming, which nobody wants anymore. Uh, there, I mean, clubhouse is just dead man walking. They're just spending investors money at this point, trying to say that they're doing something and it's just yeah, going pretty to much. be failure. <laughs> I watched Star Trek Lower Decks. You're a glutton for punishment. Well, I mainly did it because I hadn't tried out my VPN router system yet. So I wanted to make sure everything worked. And I was able to, because Paramount Plus is not available in Canada. If you try to launch the app and you're on a Canadian ISP, it basically just says, we're not available yet. We hope to be with you soon. That is so so stupid. I know. And I noticed that I had forgotten to unsubscribe. So I knew I had a valid subscription to Paramount Plus. And uh, so why not? So I... You know, set everything up, and I and I switched everything over on my Apple TV. Pretty flawless, pretty quick. It went great, and I was able to access Paramount Plus, which is fantastic. And then I was able to subject myself to watching Star Trek Lower Decks. They've learned some lessons since last season. I'll give them that. It's fine. It's not great, but it's fine. Okay, define fine because it's supposed to be funny. Is it funny? Did you laugh? Did you guffaw? Did you I, I, slap I, your I had knees? Some- I had some minor chuckles. Great. Okay. Star Trek Lower Decks, the purveyor <laughs> of minor chuckles. Uh, I also used my uh, VPN setup to be able to get the Grand Tour Lockdown, which is out on US Amazon Prime, but you have to pay for in Canada. So I got it for free by switching everything over. And I'm glad I did because this felt a bit like a return to form for me. It's another one of their you know trip ones. It was done during COVID. So lots of funny COVID, you know, them being old men complaining about like having to follow rules. Uh, It felt a lot less scripted. I laughed quite a few times. It was nice. I'm I'm glad I watched it. 
which I was not feeling like the last couple times with Grand Tour shows. Yeah. So here's the interesting thing about this. This has been out for a while now. And I, I, was, I, was, I was actually going to throw it in, the, in Media Candy saying, Amazon really kind of screwed the pooch because I didn't see anything about this. I saw it a couple of weeks ago and I'm like, did they really just release a new one that I, has, has not been promoted to me? Yes. Yeah, they have not really promoted it no. very much. No, so. which is interesting. Mm-hmm. So um, since you put it in here, I went and watched it last night. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It's um, the, the issue that I had with it is, man, these guys are really old. Yeah, they're getting old. They're really old. Even Richard Hammond, who is like, you know, the bright-eyed, the, bushy-tailed the young guy. Spry one, yes. No, he looks like a haggard old man now. <laughs> they all do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. granted, COVID times, but COVID times. But, um yeah. I thought it was I thought I'm, it was okay. It I I didn't like the ending at all. I didn't get the ending. I mean, it totally like I'm just like, what the fuck was the ending? <laughs> but um for the most part, it was it was fun. I mean, it was fun. It the thing is, I think our expectations are so low now, based That's on the true. previous ones, that it's it like, is, uh, yeah, that is that is very true. We have very low expectations of them now, so I, I kind of hope they pack it in. And just I stop. do too. I mean, Jeremy yeah. said that they're going to be back for sure because I think that they do have like a four hundred year contract. Um, no, that's true. Um, they got a lot of money from Amazon. But I think if they kept it like this, it would be better because it was low key. It was definitely yeah. low key. They didn't go over the top. They didn't try and blow any shit up. Um, yeah. And I thought it was fun. I I, I did yeah, enjoy it. Was it. Fun. Yeah, it was. It, trust me, it's better than the last three of them, at least. Yeah. So I threw this next link in the show notes. Well, first off, because I thought it was a pretty good interview. Um, secondly, because there are three of these items have been around since I was a, a teen. Um, Danny Elfman, Oingo Boingo, mm-hmm. uh, Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, and Entertainment Weekly. Yeah. Never in my wildest dreams did I th- think there would be an interview with Danny Elfman and Trent Reznor within Entertainment Weekly, but that is how the world has changed and how the random weird stuff that we listened to back when we were kids is now totally mainstream. So there you have it. Yeah. It's a good interview. They did a song together. I don't think the song's all that great, but I liked hearing them talk to each other. It was pretty cool. Okay, cool. I'll check it out because yeah. I do, I do, oh, I, I really love Danny Elfman. Trent Reznor, I can leave or take, but yeah. All right. Anyway, I'll and uh, I paid for the podcast, which I guess we're going to say isn't really a podcast, but because you had to pay for it, but it's a podcast behind a paywall. I don't know. It's a uh, show. Absolutely you mental. paid for audio entertainment. I paid for an audio <laughs> entertainment, and it was not on Clubhouse, and I could not tell where they were sitting spatially. <laughs> what? You couldn't and tell I did if they not were care. behind you? <laughs> I did not care, but it's Ricky Gervais and Sam Harris, and you know they pick, there's, I, what, how many shows? I can't remember. 11, 11 episodes ranging from 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Perfect length for a podcast. Okay. fourteen ninety nine. It was worth it. I really enjoy, I like both of them. Cheaper both than a movie. together. You know, chocolate and peanut butter. They went together really well. Okay, good. Yeah. Like I said, cheaper than a movie. That's, you know, yep. at least, you know, five hours of entertainment for 15 bucks. Yep. And uh, Shirley Manson is back with her The Jump podcast. Uh, new season, new artist. So, uh, you know, I love Shirley and I like to hear Shirley talk to people. So if you have an interest in any of the musicians she's actually talking with, worth a listen. I, These are free. I listened to two <laughs> of them. I listened to the David Byrne episode, which I thought was fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. I really like that episode and uh, the Alanis episode, which I'm sure you yeah. had issues with, but I, thought- I didn't have any issues with it. I, I, you know, Alanis has turned herself into like this. She's done a bit of revisionist history on herself. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, but but I, it was yeah. fine. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because uh, yeah. the, the nice thing about Shirley's show is that they have buckets of money and they actually play the songs <laughs> that they're talking yes. about <laughs> exactly yes they they are they they spend the money to be able to license the tracks <laughs> exactly so i no i really like it i'd i I'd probably end up listening to the other ones just because I, I it's shirley manson man come on yeah talk about you know crush of crushes <laughs> you just mm-hmm. got to um i've been watching icon music through the lens which is a pbs special on music photography Cool. And it is so good. I am. I'm, this is one of the ones where I'm kind of just. I watch like half of an episode a night because there's only six mm-hmm. episodes, and I've been like really slow trickling it out. I was going to watch some last night, but I ended up watching uh, the Grand Tour. Um, it's really fascinating because I mean, music photography for me was one of the best things. It's so much fun. It's so much right. fun. And I want to go through. It's actually got me inspired. I want. To, I'm, I'm not going to NFT them, but I'm actually going to go make a coffee table book of all the bands that I've shot. So I have like a record of the stuff that I've done. 
And, uh, it's just really cool. It's really cool to see the behind the scenes stuff and see the photographers and hear their stories about, you know, how they got the shots. It's really, yeah. it's really, really cool. It's on PBS. Some of it's streaming. Uh, you might have to go to Sweden for some of it, which I did. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a really cool, really cool series. If you like music and you like photography, it, it is the, it is the peanut butter and chocolate, like you mentioned of, uh, <laughs> of TV. And I've been watching clickbait on Netflix, mm -hmm. uh, Adrian Grenier's in it, Vince from, you know, Entourage. Oh yes. That show you love. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's coming back, by the way. They finally got everybody on board, even Adrian. So and they just got to, they, they're waiting on Marky Mark to sign off and go talk to the. Basically, they're like, um, we got everybody on board, but we don't know anybody at HBO. So Mark has to go hat in hand to HBO to get them to give us money to actually make the show. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> God. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. But anyway, this is a murder mystery type of thing. It's an eight part series where it's six point. Two five right now, uh, right. but it's fun. It's one of those ones where you you they don't tell you who it's going to be. Like they t they telegraph every single character, so you're always just like, oh, who's this person? Who's that person? What have they done? It's just fun. It's it's right. seriously like Lifetime Channel quality show. It's, it's excellent. Yeah, so it's it's fun, <laughs> but it's cool. it, it it has to do with uh, a quote unquote internet crime. So ah, gotcha. Yeah. All right. And I saw this news and I got both intrigued and terrified. Um, Apple is building a classical music streaming app after buying Prime Phonic. Now, I am a big fan of classical music. Uh, the yes. biggest part with classical music is curation. Mm -hmm. There are so many versions of everything, which is, you know, which are the good ones, which are the ones that you have to listen to, which orchestras, which, you know, th there's a gazillion things. And, and people have been trying to crack that nut for years. I mean, I remember way back in the early days of the web when there was the music store, The Warehouse. Mm -hmm. And I was contracted to build out a classical section because they were doing a, their own version of a curated, you know, best of by the best composers and the best time, et cetera, et cetera. So people have been working on that for years. What I can tell you is Spotify is absolutely failing at it. And I don't even think they're bothering because there's no bread or butter and, or money in classical music for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's horrible. It's a horrible experience. So they say that they're going to release their own dedicated classical music app next year, which will combine Prime Phonics user interface with some of Apple's own features. I'm hoping one of those features doesn't go into your own library and destroy it because that seems to be one of Apple's <laughs> biggest features for their music apps. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to hear that it's going to be a separate app and not the app, Apple music app itself. Uh, yeah. There's no I'm assuming it's going to be some sort of subscription, probably because, again, classical music does not make money. So we'll yeah. see. Uh, I'm I'm colored intrigued, but also worried because Apple just seems to always fuck up their music stuff. Yeah, I because I have since I have Apple One, I get uh, Apple Music, and the interface is terrible. Half of my albums, my favorite albums in the world, aren't there, even yeah. though I have it tied to my physical account, which yeah. has all of the MP3s. <laughs> uh, most of it still doesn't show up. Uh, basically, what I've done now <laughs> since I got this Superphone. Um, I was going to talk about this next in apps and doodads, but I can do it now. Um, so since I got this uh, 12 Pro Max, it's crazy. My iPad use has gone to almost zero because this thing is so right. freaking big <laughs> that it does almost everything my iPad does. And it's just nuts. But I, ha I, I just uploaded my entire music library to it and said, screw it. <laughs> I'm just not going to wait right. around anymore. Uh, I'm looking forward to this for sure. I've been listening. I think it's KUSC here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. One of the mm -hmm. best classical stations. And yep. uh, I found that because that's what I have my car set to when I get in is playing classical, which I have found driving on the 405 when I have to go to Beverly Hills uh, <laughs> is the greatest thing in the world. I am just calm. I am just always calm now when I drive. So I loves me some classical music and I've been getting back into it a lot. So yeah. this is KUSC good is great. Mm -hmm. You can't beat it. And I'm 99.99% 99 .99 sure you can listen to them via any of your ladies in the tube. So you should check it out. If you don't live in the LA area, you can still listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have it set on my Sonos. So if you go to the Sonos app, you can, you know, tie it in and listen to it through there. So it's a great station for sure. Ups and doodads. So I put this in here just because I like it when anybody confirms something that we've been saying for like 10 years. And that's kind of what happened. This is from Wired. You're probably not using the web's best browser. 
Remember when web browsers were useful tools? Remember when you could follow sites you like, check your email, see your calendar, all without leaving the browser? Or should I say, remember when you could do all that without big tech feeding your personal data into the yawning maw of surveillance capitalism? <laughs> nice. <laughs> I remember those days because I am still living in them, thanks to a web browser you may not have heard of. Well, you have, dear listeners, Vivaldi. That's right. That's right. The browser that we championed a while back, then went away from, and then kind of came back to, and then I think you went away from it, but I've not left it. I've been using Vivaldi strongly for at least about two years now, and they just came out with 4.0, which seems like uh, it's very good. So, I mean, I thought it's been good all along. I don't even use all the bells and whistles, but I just think it's really good at basically keeping as much of my data private as I'd like to have private. Yeah. So I, I went to Brave for a while because of there was a, I had a bug in mind where when I would create a new tab, the URL bar, the location bar would not get focused. So I'd have to type command T, then command L, or you yeah, have to remember to do that because I would start typing a, you know, a, a search or a URL and it would just go off into the ether and it wouldn't do anything. And it pissed me off so much. I'm like, fuck you guys, I'm going to brave. <laughs> and brave was just, it, I, I grudgingly used it. I kind of bend it to my will to make it do most of the things I wanted to do, but it right. still sucked because the, the great part about Vivaldi for me is speed dial. So when you open a new tab, you have a curated giant list of the sites you go yep. to the most. Vivaldi, I mean, Brave kind of had that with very limited types of uh, sites you could put in there and you could only have mm -hmm. like a very small amount. You could have eight. And I'm like, oh, well, uh, excuse me. No. Um, Even MySpace let us have more friends. Seriously. Seriously. So uh, when I saw this, I'm like, ooh, they got a new version. So I went, downloaded it. And the great thing is everybody's Chromium based now. So it imported all of my Brave settings, all of my passwords and everything that was just such a nightmare before because it's all using the same tools in the back end. And it just mm -hmm. brought it in. And it took me like five minutes to set up. And I've been back on Vivaldi and I fucking love this new version. The, yep, the web great. panes are really cool. So I've got like a little Twitter pane pop up that I can just click on that and I can see if there's anything to look at. If not, close it. I don't even have to go to, you know, a new tab to open it. Uh, it's fast. It's just, it's everything that I loved Vivaldi for, but it works again, which is great. Mm -hmm. So I'm so happy that it's back. And my app of the week is called Meco, M-E-C-O. I found this uh, Mark Frauenfelder hat tip to him for this one. I found it on his newsletter. What it is, is it's an app for iOS. I don't know if there's an Android version. I didn't look. I don't care. Um, but what it does is you set it to um, newsletter sender addresses, and it will take all of those emails that come from your newsletters and give you a, a nice clean interface to look at your newsletters outside of your inbox. Right. Which is, and it creates a new, like, like I'm in Gmail. So it creates a new thing for a new folder for those or a new tag or whatever, and uh, just keeps them separate. So they never hit your inbox, which is cool. awesome. Um, like I said, the interface is pretty cool. Uh, it's free right now. I would prefer a paid version where I could actually put in more than one email address because you can only use one email address and I have newsletters coming across five different emails. So, which right. is, you know, I, it's too, it's too tough to go consolidate because those are the logins for the sites and you and I share some of these logins and it's just like, Oh Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> um, can I just add another one, please? Uh, but Please. for what it is, I, so I use my main one that gets, you know, 90% of my newsletters. But it's a really nice little app to say, like, I'm in newsletter mode. I'm going to go sit outside, have a cup of coffee, sit with the dogs, and read my newsletters. It's perfect. And then, I like, when I wake up in the morning, there's not 100 newsletters crufting up my inbox. Yeah. So check it out. It's good. At the library. Brian, I've been reading again, or listening, okay. as it was. I haven't been. <laughs> uh, I read Double or Listen to Double Star by Robert Heinlein, back from okay. the 50s. Uh, great book. Has you could, you could have written this book and not made it have anything to do with sci-fi, but right. uh, it's a fantastic book. It, it's very much like, uh, what was that Kevin Klein movie where he became the president? Um, oh God, I love that movie. Yeah, this is Dave. this is yeah, Dave. Dave, such a good movie. This is basically Dave. 
Okay. So it's really cool, but Dave in, on Mars. <laughs> so it's, uh, Elon it's a, Musk. <laughs> yeah, it's a short book, but it's fantastic. Uh, cool. Heinlein is just so fucking good. I've been getting into yeah. this. You know, when I want to do sci fi now, I just prefer going back and reading classics that I haven't read because it was so good back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and now it's like, it seems like all of the sci fi that we get lately is just all near future sci fi. It's near future, professor, hot girl. Blah, blah, blah. Corey Doctorow, like I know how to install Tor type of bullshit. It's like, I want to go back to the old days. And th this one is <laughs> so good. Uh, and I'm also listening to Drunk, How We Sipped, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way to Civilization by Edward Slingerland. Mm -hmm. This book's fantastic. <laughs> it, it is, it's a history book about alcohol. History of booze. It yeah. is. And, and he basically posits that we would not have modern civilization without people getting fucked up together. <laughs> and... It, it makes a great case. It is a it is a fascinating book about the history of booze and nice. uh, the psychology behind it. And uh, it, I mean, I highly recommend it. Brian, you'd love this book. Uh, that sounds right up my alley. Moron of the week. Brian, I have a hat tip to a friend of the show, Chris Lockhead, who pointed this one in my direction that I totally missed. Uh, Bloomberg has canceled Professor Scott Galloway's TV show after he mm -hmm. joked about his sex life in a video topless in a hard hat. Did you watch this video, Brian? I did. I love Scott Galloway. I love the fact that he actually tried to make a promo video that way, not really understanding that Bloomberg is Bloomberg. Um, it's great. It's awesome. I, it sucks he got canceled. I, I that they they decided not to to give him a show, but uh, he poked the bear. What did you think was gonna happen? Exactly. <laughs> he poked the bear. So he poked the bear. You know, he doesn't need it. He doesn't need the show. He doesn't need the money. I, he's got enough shows. I think he's got like eighteen thousand podcasts. No, I, he doesn't. Enough... Brian, after this, I don't know hmm. if he. Well, you don't. Do you still listen to Pivot? Because he's been gone. No, he's on vacation though. It was a planned oh, vacation for all sure of August. Sure, it is. Sure, it no, is. It was. It was. Okay. He says he does it all the time. So he's coming back to Pivot and his own show I think is the off. Next too. episode. Um, his, well, again, it's his planned vacation. He took August off. Okay, we'll see. He said that goes. before any of this happened. That okay, he was going to do that. So All we'll right. see. I mean, if he comes back and he doesn't have anything, I mean, Jesus Christ, he can do his own podcast anytime he wants. That's true. That's true. So. Uh, I, I've actually been enjoying Pivot more without him. Um, now, if they could just replace uh, what's her name, Kara Swisher. <laughs> Kara Swisher. If they could replace Kara, so Swisher. basically, you want Pivot as a completely different show that isn't Pivot. Exactly. That's exactly okay. what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I, Might I recommend Grumpy Old Geeks, Jason? I, I that sounds like a mighty fine show. Where would I find that? I don't know, since nobody else can seem to find it, according to your, the stats <laughs> you posted on Twitter this morning. I know. Oh God, maybe maybe we're just the morons of the week. But yeah, I just it, it's just like what the hell? <laughs> and I I love him. I I really do love him, and I I think it's it's hilarious. Um, you know, but yeah, you're not doing a show for MTV, man. You're doing a show for Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what is the thought process? Like, let's go full on None. village people for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Security? Ha! Dave Bittner is back. Dave is the host of the CyberWire podcast, co-host of the social engineering podcast, Hacking Humans with Joe Kerrigan, co-host of Caveat with Ben Yellen, where they discuss law and policy and surveillance and privacy. And he's finally the co-host of Recorded Future, where he takes you inside the world of cybersecurity threat intelligence. Uh, I've been watching too much Big Brother. I'm going to go, Dave Bittner. <laughs> Racers, hot rodders. Sunday, <laughs> world of wheels, 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 wheels. You might pay for the seat, but you're only going to need the edge. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone my whole life without ever attending an event like that. I feel like no, I'm missing out. No, me too. Hmm. I, I would like to, though. I hear it's very loud. I, I think uh, going to a tractor pull or one of those yes. things, it, I'm fascinated that they bring in so much dirt into an so arena. So <laughs> much dirt. <laughs> yeah. And then tomorrow, yeah. they're going to have a basketball game. Right. That's the crazy or, thing. Or, a, or, a, or an ice hockey yes. uh, event, you know? Uh -huh. So, <laughs> so they got to, I guess they, they lay down the dirt on top of the, 
the covering of the ice or something. I guess once you have ice, you keep the ice as long as possible. No, the ice, ice act, the ice make. actually they make the same day. The ice is pretty. Oh, pretty really? Cool. Yeah, they make the ice the same day. They just have a. Okay. Basically, they fill it with water and freeze it up. But uh, they can do it that fast. Yeah, huh. they can. It's it's amazing technology. But I did huh. see a <laughs> I did see a monster truck rally when I used to live in Virginia Beach, and uh, you certainly are missing out if you have never been to one in person. It is spectacular. <laughs> I mean, it is spectacular. I uh, I think I hear it's like going to an air show where mm-hmm. you're not prepared for how loud fighter jets are. Oh yeah, right. right. <laughs> Which is funny because right down the road is where all of the uh, the air shows were. This is when I lived by Oceana Naval Air Station, so we'd go see yep. three air shows a year. But uh, one yeah. time we went to go, uh, we went and saw the Monster Truck Rally and. The the things that I take away from that is, yes, they are insanely loud. They jump higher than you can imagine, and they're hmm. bigger than you can imagine. It, it was just right. – it's just fun. It is just Well, having both fun. of those things right in the same area, I'd imagine there are a lot of people in their 40s and 50s that live in that area that have hearing aids already. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. What, Bob? Yeah. Oh, dude, when a when no. a uh, uh, a carrier would come in and it would offload, it takes three days of constant overflights to unload an aircraft carrier, and then three more to put all the planes back on. Mm-hmm. So we lived a couple miles from the end of the runway, and shit would just fall off our walls all the time right. because just the vibration. <laughs> and this was wow. this was back in the days of the when the the F fourteen Tomcat was king. This was Top Gun days. You know, this was the eighties. Right. So yeah. I love those things so much. I love air shows. You cannot you cannot keep me away from an air show. No, they're they're a lot of fun. We used to uh, go down to the Andrews Air Force Base open house regularly and uh, see that one. But I've been to the one you describe also. I've been down there as well, and yeah, it just never gets old. It's, I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> American firepower on display. I, so I feel I feel a little bit of shame for uh, just how you know jingoistic it all is. But boy, is it fun! It's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When those blue angels are coming by, and you can almost like touch them as, as they're coming yeah. across and blowing your hair out the way. Uh, for, yeah. Fortunately, I was never at, at any of the shows where anybody crashed. So there's always that, but there's yeah. always, it's like going to see NASCAR, you know, it's just like any, any, at any given moment, all of us could be dead because a bolt <laughs> came loose and that's kind of part of the fun. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, it is a lot of fun. <laughs> it is. All right. Well, thanks guys. Listen, I'll talk okay. to you next week. All uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we'll be talking about Disney on Ice. (laughs) I've been to that. I have been to, yeah. (laughs) Okay, you guys can talk about that one then. (laughs) Those of us with kids. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Because if it's worth doing, it's worth doing on ice. That's right. right. That's right. (laughs) Next year, Hamilton on ice. Mm -hmm. So I picked this story up because it just seems right up our alley. We spent a lot of time talking about things that we're kind of okay with as long as there's a warrant, things that we're not okay with if there isn't the warrant. I just love this story. Uh, Sheriff's deputies in Colorado tracked down and arrested a man using Apple's Find My iOS app, claiming that an officer had, and this is in quotes, of course, lost his work phone in the bed of the man's truck after the suspect <laughs> fled the scene. So they recognized this guy. They knew that he had a warrant out and he was uh, fly- in flight to avoid prosecution. Uh, so while trying to persuade this guy to get out of the car, according to the release, the officer left the phone on the rail of the truck bed to go retrieve his handcuffs, at which point the phone allegedly fell into the truck as Sandoval sped off. So there you go. <laughs> okay, okay, um, okay. Here, it's not so much that the, he put the phone on and it fell off, that he went to go retrieve his cuffs. That's why they have the bat belt. Why would he have mm-hmm. to go, re, quote unquote, retrieve his cuffs? I, I believe yeah. the entire tone of this article is somewhat suspect as to the police's story about how this all went down. <laughs> Tongue <laughs> firmly planted in cheek, as it were? Yeah. So they're saying I'm that reminded- obviously... You know, uh, this, the, the real issue here may be, was it an accident or not? Because if it was not an accident, well, then we've got some issues. Mm-hmm. Accidentally on purpose. Yes. I'm reminded of uh, that scene, I don't know, or sometime early on in The Simpsons where Chief Wiggums was at uh, The Simpsons' house. And he says, now, where did I put my gun? Oh, yeah, I put <laughs> it down when I got a piece of cake. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like... <laughs> like 
Uh, police officers just mm-hmm. willy nilly leaving their phones around on other yes. on people's cars and yeah. And they're and, I'm and have they're to talk just... to Yellen about this. The story got a little bit further into it as to why they seem to have uh, found him so quickly. And it was the officer had realized, oh, dear, that's my work phone. That's 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 a that's property of the government here. I should probably find that as soon as possible. So then he used his personal iPhone to start to track down the work iPhone. And well, well, this guy seems to be driving around town. We should send some squad Hmm. units after him. So, yeah. Hmm. Okay. there you go. So there's it that. is an that interesting question. I mean, is that I, I say I'm going to run this by Ben Yellen to see yeah. what his take yeah. is. Uh, is this a Fourth Amendment violation? If if you accidentally, hmm, it's interesting. Yeah. I don't know. As we say, yeah. get Yellen on the horn. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. We, we, we need an expert on the Fourth Amendment. Get Yellen <laughs> on the horn. <clears throat> and then, of course, I have the story about the T-Mobile hacker uh, who said that the carrier security is just awful his name is john bins and he Mm -hmm. told the wall street journal this and he broke through using readily available tool to find an exposed router and took a week to delve through customer data stored in a data center near east wenatachi washington wherever that might be uh who he he provided evidence to back up his claims of involvement and he says he breached t-mobile and stole the data to create noise that drew attention to him because he apparently might be a little bit nutso. He wanted to highlight his claims. He had been kidnapped in Germany and placed into a fake mental hospital. There's no evidence to support that. We just know he did break into T-Mobile and apparently, <laughs> yes, the security was awful. <laughs> well, he might be in yeah. an, an actual mental hospital soon or at least some some facility run by the state. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess this... Uh, puts question to his uh, his claims must be considered with a grain of salt given his uh history of uh of uh, mental challenges so uh, yes. we'll leave him with that uh but uh yeah certainly a big uh stain on T-Mobile's record not that it's been great i mean this is their fifth in 3 years i believe and now they're getting uh, just a ton of uh, class action suits against them for this so yeah uh, yep. T-Mobile has to up their game <laughs> when it comes to this because uh, it's pretty bad. There, I mean, just re- re- I don't. It's interesting to me. Like, so T-Mobile is the low cost provider, right? Right. Low low cost mobile provider here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And so, if you're someone who's shopping on price, is this going to affect your decision to use T-Mobile or not? The, uh, the, 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 uh, quite the parallel to the discussion we had just a few weeks ago where we were talking about how there's now a division between people who use who pay the premium for Apple products and their security and people mm-hmm. who prefer to get the cheaper, almost free Android devices and no security. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Should security be expensive? Should to... to the ent- the entry level for security must there be yeah. a barrier to entry? Yeah, yeah, interesting, well, interesting. What about Ryan Reynolds? Is he going to come save the day with Cricket Mobile? <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, none of these guys actually own their hardware. They just rent uh, Spectrum from the other providers who actually built the towers. Yeah, so. they piggyback. A lot of cable providers here in Canada do that. Yeah, yeah. You'd yeah. think that with all that extra time they have on their hands from not actually having to build infrastructure, they could, I don't know, put a fucking password on it. But who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have uh, like I've had my parents' uh, mobile accounts on. I think it's called Ting Mobile. Yes, Ryan I use Ting. G. Yes, Ting mm-hmm. is yeah. Ting is uh, the same guys that uh, are from Hover. Uh, which is a yeah. sub uh, subdivision of Two Cows, which is out of Toronto, where Brian lives yep. yeah. now. Yeah, mm-hmm. I have a tank. For I have a tank folks phone like, too. Yeah, yeah. For people like my parents who basically don't use their phones or any data, <laughs> it's yep. a very it's a very reasonable way to hook up something. I mean, it's probably thirty bucks a month for both of them, and it's oh, a wow. very reasonably priced shiny brick that just sits there. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I pay that's eight, exactly what it does. I pay eight dollars a month for mine, which I so I got a SIM and I put it in my uh, Galaxy S7 Edge that I have. Mm-hmm. And so just in case, you know, because I live in earthquake, fire, tsunami, death country here, uh, in case the main network goes down, I have at least another phone to be able to back up to and mm-hmm. check things out. But, yeah, it cost me eight bucks a month for not even using it. When I use it, it jumps to eleven dollars. <laughs> When I turn it on, yeah. basically when I turn it on and the voicemails all come in from all the spammers, I have to pay another $4 <laughs> a month. So I, I yeah, rarely yeah. turn it on. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, but uh, again, it's one, one of those companies who are just buying time from the other providers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and hey, that can work out. Yep. yep. Uh, but going back to the password issue, let's talk about Microsoft Azure. Uh, mm-hmm. I love this. Microsoft Azure cloud vulnerability is, quote, the worst you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> you have no idea, my friend, what we can imagine on this show. Because I was going to say, I don't know. I can imagine quite a bit. <laughs> this, this really isn't that, bit, this isn't that far on the scale, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. 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 So their Cosmos DB product had uh, uh, 3,300 customers open to complete unrestricted access by attackers. The vulnerability Vulnerability was introduced in 2019 when they added a data visualization feature called Jupiter, uh, Jupiter mm-hmm. Notebook to Cosmos DB, and uh, it was turned on by default. <laughs> and uh, that's Jupiter with a Y, yes. of course. Jupiter, yes, of course. Jupiter, Jupiter, Jupiter. Jupiter. Yeah, it's kind of like- so I can already imagine something worse. Uh, you know, Amazon Web Services for like the first five years. Oh, ten. All of their ten customers. Years. Ten, ten years. years. <laughs> All of their customers were open to complete unrestricted access by attackers for quite some time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, put mm-hmm. it in a bucket and say mm-hmm. fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Microsoft uh, been taking it on the chin here uh, past month or so between this and the print nightmare thing, and yep. uh, they're just. Uh, not uh, <laughs> not, not up to their normal time standards. For them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw it's a, a shame. I saw a headline uh, last week. I forgot to put it in the notes, but it was like Google and Microsoft uh, are are basically setting aside their earmarking thirty billion dollars for cybersecurity over the next X amount of years. And I'm like, okay, this shouldn't be news. I shouldn't be reading about <laughs> this because Microsoft sells the product that everybody uses to break into everything. So maybe this should be I don't know job one. You know, mm. I would like to see, you know, that whole like uh, uh, back in the uh, auto plants, they had zero days without a, or 340 days without an incident or without an injury. I would like to see that without a, a cyber attack or 0. 0.05 milliseconds without a cyber attack. Point zero six. Yeah, it would oh, basically. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, don't you run into the issue? Like, it's uh, it'd be like if Bob on the assembly line for uh, you know Corvettes lost his arm two months ago, and nobody knows it yet. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. They have to yeah. backdate all these things. <laughs> right. Turns out. Uh, Turns out uh, yeah. five months ago. Yeah. Is there mm-hmm. a zero day for amputation? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Poor Bob. Poor Bob. But yeah, it's these, these things are going to happen. But I thought it was just interesting. I, I, I just really like the title, The Worst You Can Imagine. I'm like, my friend, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Let me pour you a <laughs> don't beer. Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what else I, I noticed recently? I was talking to my son, Jack, who just uh, headed off to high school this week for the, for the mm-hmm. first time. He's a freshman? It's so far, so good. He's a freshman, yeah. All right. What year was he born? Oh, God, 2006. <laughs> oh, okay. So he's one year older than the iPhone. We, we had a story yeah. earlier that uh, kids that were born in 2007 are now heading off to be freshmen in high school because they're 14. And to, yeah. Yeah, to make you feel old, it was the same year that the iPhone came out. And I feel sad. I know. I know. <laughs> well, so what it was interesting to me is that evidently his generation of kids think Microsoft is really cool. Because of the Xbox. Oh. Right. That makes sense. Now, for us who grew up in the Mac versus PC days and were on mm-hmm. Team Mac, Microsoft was not cool. Speaking of Bob. Cool about Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Bob and Clippy. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think Microsoft has done a great job and, and – making with with things like the Xbox and and uh certainly they've done well in the cloud world and their 365 uh, product and so on and so forth uh yeah. who would have ever thought that people would consider Microsoft to be cool but here we are I don't know I mean I, I think know. I think they One been... of us always did <clears throat> Well <laughs> Well yeah well one of us was also a rollerblader so yeah, you know uh, no. <laughs> Between the two of you, but uh, I, they, they've been, I haven't had a problem with Microsoft for years now. Once uh, was his, uh, I can't remember his name, such a novella or whatever. I can't remember the, the CEO's name. Um, once he came in, he really yeah. kind of turned things around a lot. And I, and I think he really kind of up the, up the quality of the company. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. The one thing that really bugged me was uh, they made that really super cool surface desktop machine 
that they didn't really do anything with. That really big one that folded down and it was like a tablet and you had the little wheel that you could move around. I think the problem the problem with that device is they 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 kind of doubled down and they tried to move like their their mobile operating system that tried to bake it into the standard yeah. Windows. And I think mm-hmm. that just became a casualty of the pushback towards that where everybody was like, no, no, we don't want an op- a, a mobile operating system on our desktops. Yeah, well, yeah. they're going to be really upset when the new Mac OS comes out and they get an M1 <laughs> chip because I can run mobile apps on my M1 Mac now. But uh, right. I just thought that was a yeah. super cool piece of hardware. And I was really bummed when they first came out with it that it was just so underpowered. I'm like, put all the chips in it, man. Come on. <laughs> I would have bought one. Yeah. I totally would have bought one. But guess not. But uh, uh, yeah, I think I I still think they're doing pretty good right now. I've got an Xbox. I like it. I'd like to get the yeah. new one, but obviously you can't because they didn't make enough of them. So, yeah. But it's, I, yeah. I, I, I see how – I can totally see how they would think that Microsoft is cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh, God. That means Macs are for old people. That's right. They are. <laughs> <laughs> well, having a computer at all is for old people. That's true. If so you have a desktop true. at all. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> True that. I thought this one was really funny. This is a hat tip to our friend of the show, Vinny Lee. Banksy NFT buyer duped in a 244,000 pound hack. Uh, mm-hmm. So this guy spent $336,000 on a fake Banksy NFT. And what's cool about this is well, I, 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 you can take cool in one way or another here. <laughs> the hacker actually hacked Banksy's website, put up the NFT page, put a f- piece of fake NFT art on OpenSea and then went mm-hmm. into a Discord channel and told everybody to go buy the Banksy drop. And this guy hmm. did. So, um, yeah, I mean, I I can see how he got scammed by this. I, Banksy got pranksied. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, this came off of Banksy's official website. So yeah, yeah, can, why would you not trust it? That's not so much a scam as, as you, you got screwed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is a caper. That is a yep. caper. Yes. <laughs> so I feel bad for the guy because, you know, well, I don't because he bought a fucking NFT. But anyway, um, I still, it, it's it's a clever, yeah, clever he had, hack. He had $336,000 in disposable income. Yes, to burn. Yes, yeah. Just spend on a gift. My, my empathy guy. for him only goes so far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so. I just I thought that was a pretty clever hack. It is. It is. Uh, I put this story in here from the Washington Post, uh, and it's called YouTube Magic Dust, How America's Second Largest Social Platform Ducks Controversies. Uh, and it really outlines how, you know, with people coming after Google and coming after Facebook, that somehow YouTube seems to escape a lot of the criticism that like YouTube has. There's never been a top executive from YouTube who's had to come and testify before Congress, for example. Um, and I think this is interesting. I was curious what you guys thought. Why does YouTube, which certainly has no shortage of horrible content on it. Why does YouTube escape where the other major platforms don't? I think maybe it's because Congress doesn't really realize that YouTube and Google are the same thing or just a spinoff of it. So they just get the Google guys to come in and Mm. just talk about that because, you know, YouTube is under alphabet. So, yeah, you know, that's a good point. They they could, they could just group them together, (laughs) but, uh, yeah. And YouTube has garnered some initial goodwill by being one of the first out of the gate to to basically deplatform some some crazy folks. So they've they've kind of made some waves in that they're attempting to do something. But you are right, and that all of this horrible stuff that we see on all social media is is all over YouTube. Um, maybe mm-hmm. it just gets buried a bit more because there's so much on YouTube. Yeah, I wonder too if because. Uh, YouTube is much more unidirectional in the way that, that information goes through it. In other words, it's, it's a much higher barrier to become a YouTube creator mm-hmm. than it is to be in a Facebook group and be a contributor to a, fa- you, you know, to a Facebook group, uh, to basically a, you know, a, a chat room or anything like that. Um, yeah. so I wonder if people don't think of YouTube as being, as interactive as the other ones are. You sit yeah. down and watch YouTube. 
agree. It's, it's not really a social network per se in that if you, you have some horrible content on YouTube, you, it, you can't really spread it on YouTube. You spread it on other platforms. Mm, that's a really good point. Yeah. 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 And also, because yeah, remember- I mean, other than commenting, it's not a social network per se. It's mm-hmm. the second largest search engine, though. So there's yeah, there's a lot right. of stuff there. But also remember that the other platforms have a face. You know, there's Sundar Pichai at Google. There's Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. There's Jack at Twitter. So mm-hmm. these guys are out there as like the the big CEOs. But the CEO of YouTube is a woman and mm-hmm. doesn't really – she keeps her head down for the most part. So yeah, it's uh, it's interesting how that kind of works out. So I think Sundar might be taking the heat for that. But I mean, they have been called in front of Congress before, basically for the children's stuff. You know, yeah, it's the, mostly the, the kids algorithm. stuff. Yeah. Which, yeah, which I a hundred percent agree with. It's fucking horrible. So <sighs> you do. Yeah. So this last uh, story in here, I, I thought was interesting. Kind of flew under the radar a bit, but. Um, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, is uh, has charged eight brokerage firms with sanctions after they got hit with BEC compromises. Their their employees' email accounts got taken over, mm-hmm. and that exposed personal data of thousands of clients. These are uh, folks like KMS Financial Services, Cetera, Cambridge Investment Research. Um, and basically, the SEC has come at them and said, you had inadequate security. And so you're going to be fined. Um, I believe it was around $8 million, something like that. Right. Um, and the firms have all agreed to settle the charges. Better to, I guess, make it go away and minimize the uh, PR exposure here. Is that but, $8 million total across all the firms or is it $8 million per firm? I don't recall. That's a good question. I mean, it, 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 it really, I mean, does, does it doesn't matter. That's it's true. Really, it, it is <laughs> funny money for all of them, so it doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, but I think, I think you know, it's interesting. Go ahead. I, I think it's, you know, just pay the fines and let let all the coverage and all the eyes and all the heat go on Robin Hood, because that's where it all is right now. Mm. So mm-hmm. you can you can fly under the radar as being the old school, you know, financial organizations and just, OK, yeah, sorry about that. Here's some money. You know, we didn't mean for that to happen. Uh, but, but focus on that Robin Hood and the gaming thing that's going on. Yeah, go. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting that this is the SEC coming at them, that you have this organization that has regulatory oversight on these investment firms. And basically they're sending a shot across the bow and saying, hey, you all have to do a better job here. And by you all, I mean the whole industry or yeah. there will be consequences. So yeah. I, I think that's a, a good, good thing. It's a yeah. good thing. I yeah. mean, we yeah. don't yeah. we don't actually know what the SEC's uh, mandates are for in-house security for these people. Because, I, I mean, I remember when, uh, Brian, you and I always had to do this. When if your company wanted to take credit cards back in the day, long ago, mm-hmm. you had to harden your servers and you had to have people come in from the – you know, the credit card companies and they would yep. check your servers they would stress and they would give test you a list. You and, they would, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And they would see, and then you'd get a list of things that weren't up to date, you know, and then you'd have to update those and then they would come back and they'd give you a, you know, a, you know, stamp of approval or not. Um, and they would check you every couple months. So I'm wondering if they have these same type of regulations inside these companies and they just, you know, haven't been, I don't know, up to date with them or things like that, because it seems like, you know, if you're under the SEC's purview, uh, you should have some kind of at least, you know, checklist of things that you should be checking for. So maybe yeah. they just didn't yeah. didn't uh, fill those out or not. Now, I'm digging into the article here, and it is indeed uh, chump change for them. Satara is paying three hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> Cambridge two fifty, yeah. KMS two hundred thousand. So. These are, uh, you know, e- executive lunch bills, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but it, uh, they, you know, they're maybe, paying maybe it's the first step. I don't know. Yeah, they're paying those to stop the bleeding from the lawyers because the lawyers are going to make a hell of a lot more money than just the fine. So it's just like, you know what? Let J, J, J and J go back home and let's just pay you so it goes away because these guys are going to charge us $5 million just to fill out the paperwork so you can get $350,000. <laughs> right, right. But as part of it, they are agreeing to improve their security. So I suppose that is a good outcome as well. They're agreeing to it, but are they going to if if these, you know, these fines are such chump change, it's just cost of doing business like we always talk about. Could be, little Mary Sunshine. Could be. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> on that happy note. <laughs> hey, hey, look. 
there's a precedent. Welcome to our I'm new show. Saying. What's the fucking point? <laughs> That's it. That right, is it. Exactly. <laughs> Everything's terrible and we're slowly dying. Everything we'll be right is back awful. After this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, that bombshell. <laughs> All right. All right. All righty. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I'll thank see you next you. time. Take care. Bye. Closing shout outs. Over at Patreon, we've got Laura Leslie and Fakey McMadeup just edited their pledge from one pound to five pounds. So thank you very much, Fakey McMadeup. Thank you. Over at PayPal, we've got Adam, Thomas, Charlie, Simon, Michael, Matt, Matthew, Jonathan, John, and Judge. Sounds like the book. The Bible. I, every time these guys come up again, <laughs> I was like, the yes. Bible of GOG. Yeah. And we got a five star rating over at iTunes from Davi Torres, who says, Amazing show. I listen to a full episode every day commuting. No matter if the episode is from last year, all the shit happening on the internet is still funny. Stay grumpy. Well, thank you, Davy or Davi. <laughs> thank you. Over at the tip chart, we've got a $10 subscription from Adam D. And we got another 10 from Desiree. Super fan. Hope you're taking care of yourself, girl. And we got Jennifer MC with a $5 subscription and a $10 sub from and q thank you guys so you. much until next time i'm jason DeFilippo, and i'm brian schulmeister thanks for listening to grumpy old geeks if you enjoy the show visit gog.show slash donate to help us keep the lights on and we'll love you forever you can also help us out by sharing the show with your friends and enemies it's easy and absolutely free show notes for this episode are at gog.show slash 520 from there you can find links to everything we talked about in this episode as well as links to our swag and discord channel if you want to buy some stuff or chat with us and other show fans you can also head over to gog.show slash contact and send us your feedback or questions we can read on the air and if you're so inclined please head over to gog.show slash review and toss us a snarky review and preferably five stars stay grumpy <laughs>